It's awesome to see all of you here this morning. My name's Dave, and I'm the campus pastor here at our World Golf Village campus, and I'm glad that you've chosen to spend this Labor Day weekend on the Lord's Day with us. If you're new or visiting, in the seat backs in front of you, you'll see a Connect card, and I'd love for you to take the time to fill that out. And as you leave this morning, there's boxes in the back of the auditorium. If you'll leave those Connect cards there, uh, that would be a great place to put them. And I'd love the chance to meet you if you are new or visiting. So if you'd like to grab lunch, I'd love to hear your story and share a little bit more of what God's up to here at Good News Church. Um, mark that on your card. You'll see a, a place on there to say, I'd like to have lunch with a pastor, and it's on me. So I'd love to do that um, with you. This morning, we're going to keep going in our study of uh, 2 Timothy. So I invite you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I'm going to start reading in verse 14. I'll read through the end of the chapter, then I'll pray, and we'll jump into our study this morning. Let's pay careful attention to this God's Word. It's inspired, inerrant, infallible. It's our only rule for faith and practice. Remind them of these things. And solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless, and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter. For it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. Now, in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from those th these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. The Lord's bondservant, must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. The word of the Lord. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Let's spend just a moment in prayer. Our Father, who is in heaven, we thank you that we, through Jesus Christ, can call upon you, the infinite personal God, and, and we can call you Abba, Father. Lord, give us that faith and trust that you are our Father in heaven, and you care about every one of our needs. Father, holy is your name. Lord, may we treat your name as holy in the things that we think and say and do. Lord, may our lives continue to show who you are. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Jesus Christ, King of glory, Lord of lords, King of kings, Come in and reign and rule in every heart here. Give us this day our daily bread. We trust in you for all things. We ask that you'd provide for our needs, even as we help to provide for the needs of others. Lord, forgive us our sins. 
And help us to forgive those who have sinned against us. Jesus, I pray that you would allow the message of the cross to so deeply penetrate our hearts that we could be a forgiving people in the midst of a cancel culture. Father, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Jesus, help us to see the hook that's been set for us in the lure of the world's affections, that we might flee from the lure and we might live with you. Lord, help. Open our eyes and ears to your word this morning, for I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, this is, a, uh, this is a home plate from a baseball diamond, and who knows how wide this plate, home plate is? How wide is it? Anybody know? Close. It's 17 inches. Home plate is 17 inches. Now, when, when you guys play Little League uh, or USSSA, whatever it is, you, you guys have a plate, and how wide is your plate? 17 inches. And when you get to middle school and high school, how wide is the plate? 17 inches, you guys are quick. Now when you get to college, how wide is the plate in, in the NCAA college baseball? It's 17 inches. And in the major leagues, in the major leagues, how wide is the plate? 17 inches. You guys are so smart. 17 inches. Now, why don't they just say, listen, you know, let's just widen the plate. This poor pitcher, his self-esteem is going to be wrecked. His self-esteem is going to be destroyed. Well, let's just widen the plate a little. He's struggling. He's struggling. We don't want him to go home crying. There's no crying in baseball. So let's widen the plate just a little. Let's make it 19 inches. What would happen? It'd be 19, then it'd be 21. Pretty soon it'd be three feet, then six feet. Well, they don't do that in baseball. They don't do that in baseball, and, and, and we shouldn't do it in all of life. See, we live in a culture that has just consistently widened the plate widen the plate, widen the plate. We've been experimenting in our culture for many, many years with the idea that the worst thing you could ever do to somebody is hurt their self-esteem. You know what that's left us to? It's led us to a place where four letters, B, U, C, and A, describe our culture perfectly. And they stand for this, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. These four words characterize the world we now inhabit. In our globalized world, we are standing in three feet of gasoline, terrified that someone will drop a match. That's where we live. We live in a world that's volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And Jesus Christ, through his church, steps into our world and he says, there is a different way to live. There's a different way to live. If, if you'll take me into the center of your life and you'll begin to be called my follower, if you'll become my follower, I'll teach you a different way to live. And at Good News Church, we want to make disciples together. Disciples. What's a disciple? A disciple is a follower of Jesus. And a follower of Jesus has three great loves that when Jesus moves into the center of our life, he invites us to say yes to loving him. A disciple, a follower of Jesus, loves Jesus. A follower of Jesus loves one another, those in the body. And a follower of Jesus, a follower of Jesus loves the lost. We look out into the lost world and we say, come and see Jesus. 
Come and get to know the one who set me free. Come and get to want, know the one who forgave all my sin. Come and meet the one who gave me eternal life. And he can do the same for you. We love the lost. Over the next several weeks, we're going to be learning what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That a follower of Jesus has three great loves. They love Jesus. They love one another. They love the lost. Now this morning, what I want to do is I want us to walk through the, for the first several verses that I just read, starting in verse 14. We're going to walk through it step by step, and I want us to see two key phrases in these verses that will help us understand what it is to be a follower of Jesus who loves Jesus. And those two phrases are, first, the phrase, the truth, and second, the phrase, the faith. The truth and the faith. Now let's get there by starting in verse 14, where it says, remind them of these things. So first, who is the them? Who's the them that he's talking about? Well, if you go back up to verse 2 of chapter 2, we learn who the them is. The them is the faithful men, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these two faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The them of verse 14 is the faithful men of verse 2. Paul and Timothy understood what Jesus had taught, which was that men are our method. In making disciples, men are the method, and women. People, human beings, men and women, they're, they're the method. And here's what Robert Coleman said. It all started by Jesus calling a few men to follow him. This revealed immediately the direction his evangelistic strategy would take. His concern was not with programs to reach the multitudes, but with men whom the multitudes would follow. Remarkable as it may seem, Jesus started to gather these men before he ever organized an evangelistic campaign or even preached a sermon in public. Men were to be his method of winning the world to God. The world is standing in three feet of gasoline, terrified that someone is going to strike a match, and Jesus Christ stepped into that world and invited a few men to follow him, and he sends us back into that world to invite people to come and see who Jesus is and invite them to follow him with us. Men are the method. People matter to God, and so people matter to us. We love Jesus. And so we make disciples together. That's the them. Remind them of what these things. Now, what are the these things? Well, the these things are what we saw last week in verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. The these things of verse 14 is the gospel, the good news that God the Son took on our humanity. He stepped into this gasoline-filled world. He stepped into our world. He was fully God and fully man. Fully God and fully man, Jesus Christ lived the life we should have lived, and then he died the death we deserved to die, but he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead, just as he said he would in Matthew 16, the verse that I read earlier. He didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead, and he says if we put our trust in him, we will live on forever with him in eternal life, an eternal kind of life that begins now. Remember and remind them of these things. and Solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless, 
and leads to the ruin of the hearers, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not to be ashamed, need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. So Paul in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, Paul used three illustrations or metaphors in the first eight, seven verses. He talked about a soldier, he talked about an athlete, he talked about a farmer. And now he introduces another metaphor, the metaphor of a workman. A workman. I remember many years ago, I was visiting in Charleston, South Carolina, and Charleston, South Carolina has many, many, many very old, beautiful homes that have been restored to their original uh, beauty in the downtown area. And I was in one of those beautifully updated homes, and the owner of the home wanted to show me something that was amazing to him, and it amazed me too. He showed me underneath the stairs in the home, he opened a little door, and underneath the stairs in the home, there were signatures. They were the signatures of the original craftsman, the expert builder who had built the home. He put his signature on the home to show that he was a craftsman whose work could be counted on. He said, you can count on this home to stand the test of time. And so through hurricanes and storms and many, many things, Charleston, these Charleston homes have stayed because the craftsman, the craftsman was reliable and his work was excellent. Our excellence, our craftsmanship, doesn't depend on our skill in making disciples. It doesn't depend on our skill of entertaining people. It doesn't depend on our skill of being able to illustrate truth. The master craftsman handles the word of God with skill when he tells the truth. When he lives by faith and the reliability and the authority of the Bible is God's word to us. Jesus Christ illustrates this when he, for our sake, went into the wilderness, led by the Holy Spirit, to go into spiritual conflict with the devil being tempted. He was the second Adam. The first Adam, the first Adam had failed the test. When Satan came to him in a garden, he listened to the voice of the enemy of God and he disobeyed God. But Jesus, the second Adam, he doesn't live in a garden. He goes into a wilderness place by himself and there he faces the same test of obedience to the Father. And how is he able to pass the test? Because he lives on the basis of the truth of Scripture. Matthew 4, 4, he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus illustrates for us the importance of living on the basis of the word of God as God's spoken word to us. Three times in the passage that I read, the truth, the word of truth is referred to. You, you heard it in verse 15 that I just read. Earlier I read verses 18 and verses 25. The truth, the word of truth. What is this book? What is this Bible? It's the truth of God's word. It's God breathed. It's spoken by God for us so that we could know who he is, so that we could trust in his son, Jesus Christ, the one who's the great subject on every page of this book, so that we could trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and so find in him life eternal. An eternal kind of life that begins now and extends through eternity. Francis Schaeffer, in his book, No Final Conflict, he says this to just remind us of how important it is to believe in the truth. It is the infinite personal God 
who exists and has not been silent, but has spoken propositional truth in all that the Bible teaches, including what it teaches concerning history, concerning the cosmos, and in moral absolutes, as well as what it teaches concerning religious subjects. You see, there's many in our culture who would want to say, well, listen, that's fine. You can have your truth. If that's true for you, you can have your truth in private. But listen, don't try to bring the truth into culture, and the Bible won't have it, and God won't have it, because God says, no, my word is true. It's true for everyone, everywhere, all the time. It's true in all that it teaches. It teaches the truth about history and about the universe, and about moral absolutes, and matters of faith and practice for the Christian. It's true in all that it teaches. And it's not enough just to have, well, the Bible's nice, it's good in the category of religion or spirituality, but don't try to bring the Bible into your understanding of history or science, morality. And the Bible says, I am true, because I come from the mouth of Almighty God. God, the infinite personal God, has spoken. He's spoken through his word. And we can trust in the truthfulness and the authority of God's word. It's true. It's the truth. Verse... <clears throat> Paul goes on in verse 16, and he says, listen, this is so important. Listen to how important it is. Avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. There's an infection called sin, that every single one of us have inherited. We come into this world naturally rebels against God. The world, the world wants, wants us to buy in to the idea that I'm wiser than God. I know better than God how to rule, live my life. And the Bible says, when you believe that lie, it's like gangrene. And you know what happens when, when a limb becomes gangrenous? There's only one thing to do with that limb, and that's to cut it off. It's the only way that the infection won't spread. So great is the danger of not living under the authority of God's word. So great is the danger that, that Paul says it's like gangrene. Don't, do, don't listen to it. What is it? It's empty chatter. Avoid worldly and empty chatter. Chatter. The Bible was originally written in Greek, and the Greek word for chatter is the word kinephone, which means uh, empty, empty uh, the word kinos, which means empty, and the word phone, which is the, where we get the word phone, which means voice. Remember peanuts? Remember the teacher in peanuts? Did you know there's only one adult in all the peanuts cartoons? Only one. In all the cartoons, there's one, and it's the teacher. And what is the one adult? Wah, 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 wah. Now, I know that many, many times that's what you hear, but I believe, I believe that through the chatter of the world, the Word of God speaks to our hearts. The Word of God speaks to our hearts, and it has words of life and hope. If the world's chatter leads to gangrene, what does God's truth bring? Healing, help, hope. The empty chatter of the world 
the empty chatter of the world is nonsense. It's nonsense. It's empty noise. The empty chatter of the world has led us to a place led us to a place where today women's health means abortion on demand from the moment of conception to the moment of delivery and even beyond. That's empty chatter. It's the voice of a culture of death. We live in a culture that is filled with empty chatter. And so we live in a culture where today, where today, affirming care, affirming care means puberty blockers and radical mastectomies for teenagers. That's affirming care. That's empty chatter. It's nonsense. It's emptiness. It's a culture of death. It's gangrenous. Don't listen to it. And the alternative that the Bible gives us is to be renewed by Scripture. Listen to Romans 12, 2. Let the word, don't, sorry, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good, meets all his demands, and moves toward the goal of true maturity. The world wants to squeeze you into its mold of empty chatter. Don't listen. Have you ever been in a bar or a restaurant or a club, and and in that place there's just noise, Just loud noise, country music, dance music, conversation. It's just noisy. And you don't realize just how loud it is until you walk into the restroom. And you walk into the restroom and it's like, oh oh my gosh, I can hear. Or you walk outside the bar or the restaurant or the club after the end of the night and you realize, oh my gosh, my head is killing me. What? It's so quiet. When we come to the Word of God, when we let the Word of God direct our decisions and actions, when we let the Word of God have its place of authority, the noise of the world, the empty chatter of the world, we realize God's truth is so much better. I'm so much calmer. After I've been on a social media fast, I'm so much calmer. If I set aside Fox News for a week, I'm so much calmer. Why? Because I've walked into the restroom or I've stepped out of the restaurant into the pure, simple, quiet life of abiding with Jesus. It's so much better. It changes us. It renews our minds instead of putting more and more and more and more gangrenous poison into minds. Now that's the truth. That's the truth. J.I. Packer many years ago wrote a book called Fundamentalism and the Word of God and in it he said this, to accept the authority of scripture means in practice being willing first to believe what it teaches and then to apply its teaching to ourselves for our correction and guidance. So we let the Word of God correct us and guide us. There's balls and there's strikes. And the Word of God, God Himself speaking through Scripture, says, This is out of the strike zone. It doesn't count. It's not the life. Don't go that way. And the Word of God, God Himself speaking through Scripture, says, This is is the way. Walk ye in it. This is the way. Walk ye in it. This is over the plate. This fits with the good and beautiful life. And where do we find that? 
We find that in what we come to in the next verse, verse 18. We find it in the faith. Verse 18, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already uh, taken place, and they have upset the faith of some. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. So verse 18 says that there is something called the faith. What is the faith? The faith is the historical facts about Jesus Christ, God the Son, that he lived, that he died, that he rose again. The historical facts that are true about Jesus. That's the faith. The faith is Jesus Christ living, dying, rising again. The historical facts, it's true. The faith is the doctrinal defense of those truths that show the application and the implication of his life and death and resurrection for us, for his people. It's the doctrine. It's the history, the doctrine, and the faith includes our personal trust. Our personal trust that what we've learned about Jesus Christ and what it means for us are real. They're true. We've toenailed our hearts to it. We've attached ourselves to him. We're clinging to Jesus. So it is. It's the his history and the doctrine and our personal experience of saving faith in Jesus. What does that mean? What is saving faith? Saving faith is described in verse 19. Saving faith is is built upon the idea that God saves sinners. It's sovereign grace. It's God's grace that we're saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. That we don't do anything to contribute to our salvation. The Lord does it all. Jesus Christ has done it all. The Lord knows those who are his. In John 10, verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. John 10, 14. And I know my own and my own know me. Do you know him? Do you know him as, as the savior of sinners? Do you know him as the, as the good shepherd who's laid down his life for the sheep? He spoke of it in Matthew 16, the passage I read earlier. He spoke of his coming death. He was going to Jerusalem and he had to die. Why? As our substitute. That God was going to take all of our sin and put it on Jesus and punish him in our place. Do you know him? He knows you. Sovereign grace. Sovereign grace is those for whom Christ has died. He has saved forever. Have you trusted in him? Have you come to know about his saving work for you? You can. And grace promises. Grace promises that all who put their trust in Christ, he knows. All who put their trust in Christ, he saves. Because he's already done everything necessary to make us beautiful to God and to others. He's done it all. He knows those who are his. And when this gospel when this gospel comes into the center of our life, look at what it does. Everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. 
Now the Bible is clear that we're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. We're saved by grace. It's what Jesus has done. But you know what happens? When Jesus moves in, when Jesus moves in, he gives us a new desire and a new power to set aside wickedness. Last week, I was with my grandson uh, for his first birthday. And um, I don't know if you remember any of the songs you used to sing to your kids when they were little. I've forgotten most of them, thankfully. But they've all come rushing back. One of them goes like this. There were four in the bed, and the little one said, roll over, roll over. So they all rolled over, and one fell out. And that's just what Paul means by this phrase. Everyone who knows the Lord purifies himself. That when Jesus gets in to our life, there's some stuff that just won't fit. He says, roll over, roll over, let that stuff go. Let me in, and when I move in, there will be an expulsive power of a new and greater affection, affection for me, a love for Jesus. A love for Jesus that pushes out sin, that pushes out the desire for things that draw us away from Jesus. That's not legalism. That's life. That's life. Why would you want to go through amputation by letting gangrene grow and fester in your life? Let Jesus in and let wickedness go. Can I just close by asking you two questions? When Jesus Christ moved in, when Jesus Christ moved into your life, has he enabled you, has he enabled you to stop doing anything just because you love him? Is there anything in your life that you've stopped doing simply because you love Jesus? Is there anything in your life that you've started doing just because you love Jesus. That's not chatter. That's gospel. That's good news. Jesus has moved in. He's moved into our lives. And when he moves into our lives, he says, let me show you a new way to live. Do you have the life? Do you know the one? Do you know the son? And is the Son, as your greatest affection, enabling you to push out wickedness in your life? He will, if you'll ask him. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray that you would help us. Help us to meet with you now in the table. Help us to sup with you. You're the one we need. You're the desire of our hearts and, and you're the love of our life. I pray, Jesus, that you by your Holy Spirit would, would make your, you, yourself beautiful to us. Make yourself so attractive that, that we would welcome you into our life and, and we would be done with all the lesser things that, that don't glorify or honor you. You're the good and beautiful one, and you invite us to the good and beautiful life. Oh, Lord, I pray that, that we could fall more in love with you, and that we could enjoy fellowship with you around this table together. Lord, I pray for those who are with us this morning, and then they've never put their trust in you. And if that's true of you, won't you now? But won't you say to Jesus, Jesus, I am exhausted of trying to go my own way. I've sinned against you in many ways, and I'm sorry. Jesus, I believe you lived the life I should have lived. Jesus, I believe you died the death I deserve to die. I believe you rose from the dead. Jesus, come into my life as Savior and Lord. 
and help me become the person you want me to be. And Lord, for all of us as your followers, may we fall more and more in love with you. I pray in your name. Amen.